All right. Hey guys, welcome back to We Talk Money. Today you're stuck with just me and Travis. Nikki is out for the day. What's going on, Trav? Hey, hey. man, playing. Got some weird stuff happening in stocks this week. Just some wild short squeezes, like we've been talking about for the past couple of weeks. Kind of a uh, just a, another, I guess, regular day in crypto. You know, there's always something happening. So we've got a, a few news pieces to cover there. Uh, what else is going on? Man, you nailed it. It's just a weird time in, in stocks, at least. It's been a strange week so far. And, uh, you know, it's been a strange year, but <laughs> things <laughs> yeah. just keep getting weirder. They keep getting weirder. So it's fun, though. Keeps yeah, things interesting. Yeah. Let's just jump right into the charts and, and start taking a look at some markets and see what we've got. So um, I guess the, the big news of this week is you know, just short squeeze heaven on uh, GameStop, which That's right. well, for anybody that hasn't been following this story, which is just super interesting, what the hell is happening? <laughs> what are the, one of the great short squeezes of our time? <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, this was a stock, I, I know we've talked about it on We Talk Money before, but basically, you know, this is, an, this is a video game retailer that was left for dead, uh, highly, highly shorted, one of the most shorted stocks I've seen in, you know, 20 years of being in stock markets. And uh, I called out in August, I thought this would, could be an epic short squeeze. I thought maybe it could squeeze from four bucks to say 20 or 25 bucks. But it's gone from four dollars last August, and now it's actually peaked above one hundred and fifty per share. <laughs> I'm giving it a multi-billion-dollar market cap for a brief amount of time. I thought, and of I course, thought I was looking at a crypto chart here, but yeah, I had to remind <laughs> myself this is actually stocks. Yeah, we were talking about this uh, earlier today, but the range, the daily range on GameStop yesterday, was from basically the 60s up to the 150s. Uh, so quite a, an amazing daily range on this stock. And of course, Wall Street Bets, the famous subreddit has now become a, a cultural phenomenon. And a lot of people there making making some significant amounts of gains on call options or stock with GameStop. You know, they're essentially positioning themselves as being in a fight with hedge funds that are short this thing. And even yeah. Chamath joined in. Yeah, it's even uh, sucking in some billionaires into the game. So I, I don't know. I mean, why do you think he's doing this? Does he actually give a damn about this? Or is he just kind of, I don't know, being part of the party? This is like a million and a half dollars worth of call premium that he that he bought. So it's not an insignificant amount of money, but for a billionaire, it's you know it's kind of a rounding error. Yeah. So to me, this to me is almost like marketing expense for him. Even if he loses a hundred percent on his calls, you know he can basically claim it as like a marketing expense because he's like you know he's one with the people. <laughs> he's fighting these <laughs> evil short selling hedge funds with uh, with his call position, and the market has become a meme. So yeah. he's joining in, and uh, you know Chamath. Uh, he's, he's becoming kind of a phenomenon himself and, uh, he's, what, what do you, he's what part do you think of it. it says about the stock market when, you know, valuations really don't matter anymore, at least for a lot of like these tech companies. Right. And it's almost like some of these tickers, they just become trading vehicles, right? It's like, you know, the fundamentals on GameStop did not change that much over the past few months relative to the price swings. So what's going on? Is is reality just completely disconnected here? Is this a, a warning sign, you know, that potential dangers ahead? What do you think? I, I actually think you're right on both accounts. So there, there hasn't been that significant of a change in the business fundamentals, but there have been some actual real things happening behind the scenes. You know, there was a, a board, a board member, Ryan Cohen, who's the former Chewy founder who, uh, you know, has gone in to really try to turn the business around and add more of a digital focus. And, um, and there's been efforts by the management team over the past year and a half to improve the balance sheet and to close unprofitable stores. So there's actually some fundamental truth to the turnaround there at GameStop. And of course, they're in the middle, the middle of a big console cycle again. And so Xbox and PlayStations are, are going to bring some sales back that they lost over the last few years. But this is still a business that's going to struggle. And, you know, they're going to struggle to complete this turnaround. And so, like you said, like there's still a lot to be proven despite the stock being up, you know, 10, 20, 30 X. So there's kernels of truth in there, but it's also like, it's also just the phenomenon of a short squeeze and traders and human emotion being involved. 
And it does scare me a little bit in the sense that it has kind of destabilized markets a little bit. Yesterday, when this whole thing went down, the S&P 500 and some of the indexes actually sold off at one point mid-morning because a lot of hedge funds had to degross. And what do I mean by that? They had to reduce the size of their long and their short positions because that one GameStop short squeeze, not only did it take out a hedge fund called Melvin Capital uh, and put them on the brink of distress, as you can see there, Citadel and Point72 had to come in with rescue funds. But it also meant that other hedge funds that were short stocks that were also going up. So GameStop short squeeze spilled over into lots of other uh, companies that had high short interest. And it caused basically the, the short books of all these hedge funds to go against them massively. And a lot of these hedge funds have rules that say if you are if you have a certain amount of positions that go against you, you got to reduce your exposure on both the long and the short side. So hedge funds had to sell some of their long positions to degross to deal with this phenomenon in the markets. And so it has real effects. It's crazy. S&P was down at one point. Uh, NASDAQ was down at one point yesterday after all this happened. What so, a strange time, man. It, you know, yeah. It, the, the past couple of years, that, or not even that long really, but just recent history, it kind of feels like retail is sticking it to institutions, both on the crypto side and now the stock side. Yeah, yeah. In some sense, it's it's kind of fun. You know, like it shows that there is power of the individual still. And, you know, there's going to be some bad actors within all of this, sure. And some manipulation and some stuff that, uh, like I said, could destabilize markets in the short run. Um, but I don't cry. I don't cry for the institutional guys, you know, and right. I've been on that side. I've been on the institutional You've side. The, the light side now, man. You used to be on the <laughs> evil side. Now you're over here with us, plebs. That's right. I like, I, I genuinely like helping individual investors and I like to demystify that whole world of institutional uh, investing. Look, there's a lot of sophistication, a lot of smart people on the institutional side, and I root for a lot of those people. Um, but there's a lot of people that think they're smarter than everyone else that probably deserve to get, you know, taken down a peg sometimes. Yeah. So it, it's, it's interesting it's, to see the power that, you know, a community like a subreddit with what a couple million people, how much they can actually impact liquid markets. And yeah. I love to see it. Yeah. Yeah. So the great democratization of finance, as we say. Uh, but, you know, I think there's still a lot of funds that are doing just fine. So, uh, you know, like I said, they're uh, I also I also think it's really stupid of Melvin Capital to have been short this. You mm. know, I mean, like this is one of those things where I looked at the situation in August and I said, OK, this company's not maybe the most fundamentally sound company ever, but they're in the midst of a turnaround. And if it works, the stock's going to go up. And the stock is so highly shorted that almost all of the available float was short at that time. And so I've seen what can happen. I was involved in the Volkswagen short squeeze back in 2008 when the stock uh, went up 500% in one morning and blew out a lot of hedge funds. So I knew the danger of this. Yeah. And he, uh, I say he, but the, the people who run Melvin Capital should have known the dangers. Yeah. And they probably were already up on their short by like 60 or 70% when the stock was at $4. They should have just covered it. <laughs> so yeah, it's like, what, what is your upside on a short at, you know, when a stock has fallen from what, like 50 or 60 bucks down to four, right? Like, yeah. hopefully they took some profit. I don't know. But I mean, I, I do think this is a great lesson for how dangerous uh, shorting can be. And, you know, when things rip against you and you have this kind of self fulfilling prophecy where buying begets more buying begets more buying. That's where like an early trend that went from five bucks to 20 bucks can go parabolic in just a few days, right? Once it broke yeah. that 20, it went from 20 to 150 and basically like that. Yeah. I will say it does, the reflexivity does work the opposite direction sometimes. We saw that in, in March of 2020 during the coronavirus sell-off when, you know, markets were selling off and Stocks were reaching, you know, some stocks were reaching prices that were kind of absurd for good businesses. And that's just because of forced liquidations. And that can happen. That can happen again. And, you know, it's almost like the more we take all these stocks above their fair values to absurd valuations, then the probability rises that there could be some event in the near future where the opposite happens. And everybody who's long and making money all of a sudden gets caught too long and too aggressively long, you know, options and margin. And then everybody gets liquidated, you know? So it's you know, funny it, the parallels between crypto and stocks, right? Like at the end of the day, they're really all just assets that we can trade and trading vehicles, right? They, they mean different things to different people, 
But when you look at the chart and you see the same market participant behavior happening in both sides of the market, it's just interesting how, you know, euphoria happens in a stock like GameStop, just like we see in some of these uh, cryptos that go crazy. And then, you know, it's just market cycles, man. They, they It doesn't matter what market you're trading. Humans are humans. And we are driven by emotion and greed and fear are the two strongest emotions that typically drive these prices. And if you understand it and know how to get on the right side of it, you can make a lot of money. But if you get caught up in it and you get sucked into the hype, you'll end up on the wrong side when you find yourself just, I guess, agreeing with the herd or following the masses, which is where the danger is, right? Yeah, absolutely. Classic, like you said, fear and greed. We try to, you know, we try to buy fear and sell greed. And it's really hard, but you know that's where typically the best returns are going to be found. And yet most people, even if they know that, even if they hear those quotes, even if they try to learn that, uh, their tendency, their emotional tendencies don't allow them to actually do that. And you know, I have a bunch of friends that I had a buddy today who's a, a software guy, you know, very calm guy, uh, typically does long-term investing stuff. And he was like, I made my first day trade today on GME. I'm like, oh no. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he made money and good for him. But like, you know, this is the kind of thing that like when you start to see those types of behaviors from people that you wouldn't normally expect it from, uh, I do start to get a little bit more worried. And I, you know, for me, um, just trying to remind myself over and over not to get caught up in it and to try to just remain, remain true to the strategy, remain true to, you know, looking for the, the low risk, high reward setups and, and not try to like get too far extended given the environment that we're in. It's, it's, it's so easy to do it. I know everybody now is like seeing other people get wealthy and make tons of money on one trade. And they're like, oh, I can do it. I'm, I'm as smart as they are. But, you know. You just, Eventually, the, the music's going to stop. And when that rug gets pulled, you know, a stock like GME, you could see down 60, 70% in one day, right? Yeah. So, like yesterday, went to 150 and then down to 60 in a matter of an hour. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... And today wow. it's back up a lot, but you know you just don't know, right? You're you're playing with a, a stock where there's a ton of hot money, and when that hot money all starts to flow out at the same time, you know the opposite the opposite happens. So you get you get a pretty big downdraft pretty quickly. So yeah, just you know, caution everybody listening out there to just be careful. Um, just be smart, be smart, and be tactical about what you're doing, even if you're a shorter term trader in these markets. Um, be aware of of where your risk is, you know, lies. Yeah. So. And the, the real money is made by getting in before the masses, not chasing them when they're doing ridiculous shit like buying GME at 150 bucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. Why don't we take a look at Bitcoin and some, uh, some cryptos and talk about what's been happening there? Yeah. Are you seeing euphoria spill over there into crypto or no, is it? I, you know, it's quiet. interesting, you know, uh, over the past couple of weeks and when Bitcoin was topping out here at the local high of around 40K, like, yeah, there was definitely euphoria. We talked about this in past weeks where the market sentiment was just getting way too one-sided, um, but that's kind of calmed down. You know, we've been, let's see, the top was on January 8th. So it's been a few weeks and we had a 30% pullback off of the high in Bitcoin. And we've started to see that capital flow into other kind of sectors of altcoins. So we've seen DeFi really start to make some big moves. We've also seen obviously Ethereum and some other large caps. Um, but yeah, the, the capital flow, anytime you have a, a big bull market in Bitcoin and then it starts to pull back, some of that capital doesn't just go back into fiat, but it actually goes into other cryptos. And so that's really what we've been seeing recently. Nice. I noticed too that uh, some of the premium got sucked out of like the grayscale ETFs. You know, grayscale ETFs had at, with Bitcoin's rise over the past couple of months. I, we we noticed the the premium to the net asset value of the trust widened a lot. At one point, I think the trust was trading thirty or forty percent above the value of its actual Bitcoin holdings and Ethereum holdings, and those premiums have come in. And I, last I looked yesterday, I think the the Bitcoin ETF premium was near zero. It was, I think, still slightly positive, but um, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong. But yeah, that premium has has really narrowed. So um, that's that's actually good. I think that's healthy. And we're still um, seeing like large block buying too. It's not like, you know, with this pullback that the institutional money's dried up. If anything, it's just consistently there. Yeah. 
Yeah, so that, great yeah to that's see good that. to see. Um, yeah, also, I mean, so just talking about some things that have popped off, if we look at the gainers, so I, I just put some on this screener, I put some like minimum market cap requirements and trading volume requirements. So if we look at what's up over, say, the past like seven to 30 days, you can see a lot of uh, the larger cap uh, DeFi stuff like, you know, Uniswap and one inch and things like that. And so if we jump over to the chart, um, you can see, like, if we start with just Uniswap, so we were buying this down in the fours and fives, and this is, as of today, peaking up actually into the $13, $14 range. So this is why I like, you know, really hunting for these underappreciated or kind of sleeper altcoins after Bitcoin makes a big move, because once Bitcoin starts to come back, capital is going to look for alpha. Right. And this is one of the, the spots that it's really been starting to drive into is some of the decentralized exchanges and just infrastructure around the DeFi ecosystem. So uh, actually, yesterday I took a quarter off of the table here in the 11s, I think. But you can see, I mean, after a quick pause at a one to one measured move, this thing's still trucking higher. Nice. Great trade, though. Yeah. Yeah. This wasn't a huge position for me, but it, it was definitely a nice you know, way to accumulate more fiat that I can put back into my compounding machine. You know, this is, this is the way that we do it. You know, we trade and invest in Bitcoin. And when Bitcoin's cheap, we trade to accumulate more Bitcoin. When Bitcoin goes up, we trade to accumulate more fiat. And then we just rinse and repeat, you know, and our position sizes just get bigger and bigger and bigger over time. Mm. And then, yeah, we've also had other stuff that just keeps trucking up like uh, SNX, Synthetix, um, Aave, Compound, Maker. You know, there's just a lot of these projects that have really seen some nice gains. And overall, like if we just look at, say, the DeFi asset class, um, you can see over the past 30 days, um, all, you know, on this uh, list, you know, it's a bunch of projects, but overall it's up over a hundred percent on the month and about 25% on the week. Wow. So, yeah. Pretty big movers. It's impressive. Yeah. Still waiting on Ethereum. So Ethereum has been kind of consolidating around this range uh, where it's testing the all time high. And so we've just been patient. I took a little profit back here over the past couple of weeks, but for the most part, I'm really looking for an all-time high breakout here to see if we can get some some upside potential. Nice. Would you would you look to potentially add for the breakout trade? Yeah, yeah. I actually started scaling in a little more up here, um, just anticipating that breakout. But you know, I went heavy down in the three hundreds to try to keep my cost basis lower. Mm. Um, so you know, the trend's intact, and I'm going to hold it until something fundamentally or materially changes with the the trade. Awesome. Yeah. Something else I wanted to mention too. Um, is, you know, there's been a lot of FUD kind of floating around and a lot of the, every market cycle I see this, a lot of the old things that used to freak people out, they kind of resurface, you know, like there was a, a double spend headline that came out that really wasn't a double spend and then, you know, more tether FUD. And, you know, again, I, I think in the past has tether done shady stuff, probably, I don't know anybody there personally, but um, I thought this was a really interesting podcast from Laura Shin, um, where she interviewed uh, the CEO of Deltec, which is a bank in the Bahamas, which is, um, I believe, custody custodying a lot of Tether's cash. And I would encourage, I'll link this up. Everybody should listen to this just to kind of have a balanced opinion on how banking actually works. And a lot of the FUD that was floating around, you know, and I've gotten this question a lot, which is, you know, Chris, what do you think of the Tether thing? Is it going to cause Bitcoin to crash? I don't think so. Um, I know there's difference. Uh, there, there's a bunch of opinions out there about this, but I'm really not too worried about it. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I could imagine that, you know, if there was some kind of a significant crisis event with Tether, that there could be some short-term impacts on on the prices of crypto. But, uh, but I am... But from what I've understood, like the ecosystem, there are ways to kind of route around it longer term if they if they need to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, the the every day that goes by, Bitcoin becomes more and more anti-fragile. 
right? The, the more diverse of a market participant pool that we have, uh, the better it is and, and the harder Bitcoin becomes, right? Where in the early days, you know, it was like every exchange hack or every regulatory whisper that came out, it would cause massive panics or euphoria in Bitcoin. And it was, it was very easily manipulated because it was a thinner market, right? But now it's so diverse and it's trading so much volume on a daily basis that any anything that one country, government, company or exchange does will the the impact of that will be minimized i think and and that will continue to to improve and develop over time interesting to think about too like central bank digital currencies actually could provide a, a nice alternative to some of the existing stable coins like tether and so in that sense like i know that there are a lot of people that may be against the development of central bank digital currencies. I think we're, we're going to get them no matter what, but that could also provide, you know, an alternative to some of the existing issues with, with existing stable coins. So interesting mm -hmm. to think about that in, in the sense that like, even though central bank digital currencies might not be the thing that the crypto community is most excited about, <laughs> given the centralization of the, of them, yeah, uh, they could actually relieve some pressure or relieve some of the risk of a black swan event happening with some of these other stable coins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, know, the, something the, to think about. The more on and off ramps we have, and and the more experiments we have linked to it, I, I think that's just a net positive. Um, yeah. and you know, at this time, just looking at the regulatory picture from the U.S., you know, we've got crypto friendly people or people that at least understand and really get Bitcoin mm -hmm. as now the head of the SEC, the head of the CFTC and the head of the OCC. So I'm actually very optimistic, cautiously optimistic for the future of crypto in the US. Obviously anything can happen, but I don't see anything that really is, is making me anxious on that side. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um, let's talk about some earnings stuff. I know we're, we're kind of hitting headfirst into earnings season. What are you seeing coming up? I know uh, tomorrow we've got Apple and Tesla and some big names for the rest of the week. Anything That's you're right. keeping your eye on? Yeah. I mean, those are going to be the big ones. Obviously, Apple, Tesla, Facebook, AMD. Those will be some of the biggest ones reporting in the next couple of days. And that may actually take some of the focus off what's happening with the GME and the short squeeze stuff. So maybe back to back to business as far as uh, the markets, the stock markets are concerned when, uh, when we get some of these earnings reports. So I'll be interested to see, you know, Tesla is obviously one that's very widely watched and can be a little bit volatile around earnings. So we'll have to keep an eye on that. They do pre-announce deliveries now. So that may take off some of the uh, some of the volatility there, but you know, there's so many people that are involved in Tesla stock too. So, uh, and Tesla's knocking on a trillion dollar market cap, right? That's right. Yeah. That's, it's right around a trillion dollar market cap. Now, if you use the correct fully diluted shares. So there are sites like Coifin and Yahoo finance that use the basic shares, the basic share count from the last quarterly filing, which was, you know, back, uh, you know, three, four months ago. Yeah. But if you use the fully diluted shares, which include shares it, that it'll include options that are going to become shares that are in the money. So employee stock options, options for the convertible debt that Tesla has that are in the money. And then also some of the equity raises Tesla did, I think, two uh, two equity raises since the last 10Q. So yeah. there's about 1.1, 1.2 billion shares, dilute, fully diluted shares outstanding. So if you multiply that by today's $890 stock price, you're right around a trillion dollar market cap. Yeah. I, I don't think any websites are really showing the fully diluted market cap right now. No. Yeah. So yeah, actually today uh, it should be making headlines if people were using the correct share count, but Tesla is <laughs> right around a trillion dollar market cap. You should write so. an article and submit it to everybody and be like, hey guys, just so you know, you know <laughs> everybody's everybody's lagging by a hundred billion or so. Yep. Cool. Um, also, uh, this was a chart that you wanted to pull up. Uh, it, I, what is this ticker? This is a index that Goldman Sachs put together of like highly shorted stocks. Yep. And it had one of its largest one day gains ever that day, uh, yesterday with the, with the, uh, GameStop squeeze, which had also pushed a lot of, you know, forced a lot of hedge funds and a lot of other people to cover their shorts. And so there were a bunch of other stocks that were up in sympathy. We actually have a few in our portfolio, like Mace Rich, ticker symbol MAC, Stitch Fix, SFIX. I know Nikki's traded BBBY very successfully. So, uh, Mac, for instance, was up 20% yesterday. 
Uh, BBBY has been up significantly over the last week. So oh, a lot oh, of the yeah. uh, these are basically sympathy plays, you know, other short interest plays. And people have just been hunting these short squeezes over the last week. And uh, they've been great. Um, you know, I don't I don't like to have short interests and short squeezes be my only thesis on a stock. I like to have that kind of be icing on the cake. Uh, so the ones that we hold, like Mace Rich, I uh, still think, you know, there's good fundamental upside there. Uh, Stitch Fix may be a little bit ahead of itself in terms of fundamentals, but, you know, a good company that we've owned uh, for a long while. And so uh, it's great to actually get some some days like that where some of your stocks benefit, you know? Absolutely, man. Yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a very interesting time um, where when all of these things that are heavily shorted start squeezing off, does that create maybe a risky situation for you where it's like, okay, maybe a top is close once all those shorts get squeezed and on stuff like Stitch Fix, which I, I know you were buying at the accumulation lows here, um, does it make you want to take profit or how do you tend to think about those things? Yeah, I like to opportunistically opportunistically take profit on stuff when I think it's, you know, up for non-fundamental reasons, especially if it's like way beyond my price, you know, near-term price targets, like uh, stuff like Stitch Fix. Um, there's also tax implications though. So like, you know, I'm trying to get to like long-term capital gains holding periods on some of this stuff like Stitch Fix. So I haven't been selling. Uh, so there's also that which comes into play as well. But yeah, I love to take advantage of non-fundamental pops in, in stock prices, whether it's like a rumor of an acquisition or some short squeeze. Uh, yeah. If I think it's gone further than it ha should should have gone. Uh, I have learned though, like over the past like five years, 10 years that, you know, I often sell too early. And so sometimes you need to let these things play out even further. But uh, that being said, it does make me more cautious when there's so much risk taking in one direction. You know, the huge volume of, of call buying, the huge stampede into riskier stocks, um, the fact that it's causing other hedge funds to reduce the size of their positions could cause pressure in the market. So, you know, again, you know, buy fear and sell greed. And I like to kind of sell some greed once we get into these types of environments. Yeah. So, and, and also there's some other stuff on the, on the horizon that the markets are kind of ignoring right now that I think could become more of a problem for markets as we move further into the year. Two, two main things, the, the political environment, it's clear that the Biden administration wants to push more, uh, push more benefits in favor of labor versus capital, which could mean you know potentially higher tax rates for corporations, uh, more regulations for certain types of corporations, and that could have an effect on the market. And then also the whole inflation regime. If we do get a pretty big fiscal stimulus and he's raising minimum wage, you know, for everybody on the on the lower end of the spectrum, I think that's ultimately healthy. But it also means we could see further inflationary pressures. So that could start to cause some worries for the market later in the year. Uh, so those are just some things I'm kind of thinking about in the context of, you know, managing the portfolio overall. Yeah. And then um, weren't they even kicking around the idea of taxing unrealized gains? Yeah. And that's just such an absurd idea. Now they did, I think what was not reported very well about that whole thing was they were only talking about unrealized gains in stocks specifically and only for people above a certain wealth level. Mm. And so it wouldn't apply to most of your average individual investors. But the idea of taxing unrealized gains is so silly to me uh, because it causes all kinds of weird, perverse behaviors. If you have to pay out, you know, if you have a significant gain in stocks and you are forced to pay out on your unrealized gains, you've got to come up with that capital somehow. So that forces you to make bad decisions about either selling positions short term, which creates pressure in certain stocks. It can create uh, liquidity problems for certain people and they start to go, you know, have to borrow money and leverage up. And so there's all these weird things that can happen. I just think it's a really bad idea. In, in concept, what they're trying to do is, you know, they're trying to make sure that people can't just not pay any taxes ever because they just, you know, they don't have income, they have wealth and they just hold all their stuff long term and they never pay any taxes. And so they're trying to, they're trying to fight against that. But I feel like taxing unrealized gains is not, not necessarily right, the right way to do that. Yeah. I mean, I can just think of several scenarios where it almost, you know, talking about re reflexivity, like it could cause like death spirals because people are trying to figure out how they got to pay for, you know, the taxes on some stuff that they haven't even liquidated yet. And yeah. the other things that kind of freak me out too, I don't know if this is still getting floated out there, but you know, like, um, what was it at one point? I think it was Bernie Sanders was proposing a quarter percent transaction tax on trades. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, things like that, that mess with, 
the markets, they freak me out, right? Like in yeah. taxable income and stuff like that is kind of easier for me to wrap my head around. But when you start mex- messing with, you know, taxing the markets in specific ways, like there's, like you said, I mean, there's really weird incentives and, and situations that can pop up from that. So hopefully they don't rush to pass anything that could just end up in a really, really risky or bad situation. Yeah, I do take comfort in the fact that, you know, the Democrats do have a very, very slim majority. There's still quite a number of very moderate Democrats, especially in the Senate, that are going to be really skeptical about some of these ideas. And there will also be heavy lobbying by corporations, by investor groups and things like that before any anything like that would actually get close to being passed. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there's a there's a lot of fear out there about that, but I think it's still too early to say. I, it doesn't to me look like those are highly likely, but it is something that we need to, you know, keep on our radar as investors in the market. Yeah. Absolutely, man. Um, you know, I th- I think we can uh, keep this a, a pretty quick show this week. I know our producers back in town and so we'll be back in the studio. I feel like I'm saying that every week now. It's like, oh, next <laughs> week, next week. Yeah. But, uh, what a weird start to the year. But I know, um, uh, you know, w- with things pulling back and kind of quieting down in the crypto space, it's been kind of nice to just be able to regroup and reevaluate a lot of things. There's so many new, exciting projects coming down the pipeline in the crypto space that I just think for the next, I don't know, three, five, 10 years, we're going to have so much opportunity. And now is just such a great time to be engaged with this stuff. And, you know, again, there's a lot of risks like we're seeing with stuff like GME flying high. But if you can be disciplined and get in early and just, I guess, understand the waves that are coming in and you can ride those and and really make life-changing amounts of wealth. I don't know what's on your mind with that. Yeah. I mean, my, my whole view hasn't changed. Like I, I actually am pretty excited by this whole SPAC boom because it's bringing a bunch of new companies public, which just gives me lots of new stuff to look at. And I know there, there's going to be some froth in that and we're probably going to get some sharp sell-offs and some of the overheated stuff, but like, I'm just excited for the next couple of years, because I think there's just going to be tremendous opportunity for like stock pickers like me who do good, deep fundamental work. And so I'm just like, I'm still hunting lots of, lots of stuff. Um, still finding some interesting stuff. It's not as cheap as it was, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually pretty excited and optimistic about the next few years and markets and the opportunities that I think will be served up. So we'll be here, we'll be doing our thing and helping everybody out there, you know, try to, try to make uh, life-changing amounts of money doing it. So, yep. yeah. Awesome, man. Well, uh, good stuff. We can go ahead and wrap it up here, guys. Um, go to wetalkmoney.com, submit a question for the show. We'll be back next week with uh, Nikki in a, a regular show where we'll get to some questions. And uh, yeah, have a great week out there. Stay disciplined, trade be less, safe. profit more. Yeah, be safe. <laughs> the, the vaccines, which are really picking up some momentum. So I know that's given a lot of uh, bounce back in travel and stuff like that. So um, yeah, take care, guys. We will see you guys next week.